All right, so we're going to get started this morning with our programming. Um, this is a, another individual who needs no introduction to this crowd. I know many of us have her cookbook on our shelves at home and use it all the time. She started the Weston A. Price Foundation. Without further ado, Ms. Sally Fallon. Well, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> so I did make a few notes here. I thought yesterday as I was thinking about what I was going to say that I would just look up factory farming and see if I could get a little history of factory farming. And the thing that shocked me when I did look this up was how recent this is. It started with eggs. The earliest was about 1926, but it really didn't come into its own until after the Second World War. That was the eggs. Uh, they came first. 1973 was when government subsidies for corn began. That's when McDonald's got going. A big uh, influence on this was the introduction of chicken McNuggets. And McDonald's needed a lot of white meat. And that's when the big push for putting the meat birds into confinement began. And a special kind of meat bird with uh, very large uh, breast or as they say in the South, lots of white meat. Uh, so that was a, a big pusher. Uh, one of the things I learned looking this up was that a, a very important component of confinement agriculture was vitamins. They couldn't do this until they figured out they had to give these animals vitamins. So a lot of synthetic vitamins. These are mostly made in China today. And then, of course, antibiotics. Uh, they couldn't crowd all these animals together without antibiotics. And then they learned that the antibiotics, even if the animals didn't need them for disease prevention, the antibiotics would help them grow rapidly. So in this confinement system, we not only have taken the animals off the land, but we have developed a system to make them grow very quickly, um, sometimes in half the time that they would grow out of doors. So it was chickens, it was eggs, the egg came before the chickens. <laughs> so the eggs and then the chickens and beef. Uh, the hogs did not come in until the 1980s. I was so surprised to read that. I thought it had been much longer. And the hog confinement was developed by someone named Wendell Murphy, a, a senator from North Carolina who got legislation passed to make it very favorable to put these hogs in confinement. I remember a number of years ago I was in a farm on Iowa and the, uh, the grandfather was still alive and he, he took me all around the farm and he said, you know, when we were farming, we grew corn, uh, mostly corn, and we got paid for the corn, but what really gave us a good life was the pigs. And all of us raised you know, 50 pigs, and they went to the butcher at around Christmas time, and there was a, a butcher right in the town, and that was the, the extra for us. That paid for the Christmas presents. That paid for the upkeep of the house. That paid for special things for the children. The, it was the hogs that made farming worth it for us. And the confinement system took that away from all farmers. I think about 97% of all hogs now are, are raised in confinement. So what happened was in each of these animals, eggs, chickens, beef, we, and we mustn't forget the dairy cows, um, which were uh, a bit, little bit slower to be consolidated, but uh, eventually have been, and beef and then hogs. In each of these animals, they're, they are controlled by three to five companies. So confinement agriculture has really affected the economics of rural life and impoverished millions of farmers. 
Uh, so, you know, you think this is a big capitalist corporate system, right? But it actually fulfills the Marxist dream. Marx wrote and really promoted the industrialization of agriculture and preached that animals should be units of production. So they're no longer sacred. Uh, so this whole corporatization of farming actually pushed everything into the Marxist ideal. And I think a lot of people who work in agriculture who promote this system as being necessary to feed the world or whatever else they think about it, um, would be shocked to learn that what they're actually promoting is the Marxist ideal. So along comes managed grazing, and this is another thing I think we need to realize. Managed grazing is, is new. Uh, in ancient times, you had shepherds. That was, that was managed grazing. But when you started to enclose the land, you no longer had shepherds. Um, we didn't understand this notion of keeping the animals moving all the time. So basically what you ended up with is continuous grazing uh, with a lot of degradation of the landscape as we, as we know and, and not very good for the grass. So the real, uh, it's just like a huge step. It's like the invention of the airplane or the computer or something. Managed grazing just changes everything about how we think that we should be doing things. And it's true science because it's, it's a science that's looked at nature and figured out how nature would work, figured out why nature works this way and why it is so important, and then has figured out how to imitate it. And of course, the number one tool for us is movable electric fencing. I'm very proud to say that my husband's grandfather was the first farmer in New Zealand to use electric fencing. Isn't that neat? <laughs> so we like to talk about splendor from the grass. So we get s splendid landscapes. We get the res restoration of areas that have become desert. It's just such a powerful image for people to see these before and after photos. Get splendid animals. Hopefully, we will restore a splendid rural economy from managed grazing. But we also like at the Weston A. Price Foundation to talk about splendid people. Because our view is possibly a little different from uh, the view of people who've uh, come to this from other directions. And we all come to this from different directions. But what, what did Weston Price discover about traditional cultures? So he traveled all over the world. He found 14 indigenous groups that were splendid. He often talked about splendid physical specimens. And we have this wonderful little video of Weston Price on our website. And there's, Weston Price was kind of a, a, a short man. And there's this very tall South Sea Islander with you know, splendid physique. And Dr. Price is patting him on the chest like this and saying, see this splendid physical specimen here. <laughs> But he was in awe of what he found uh, in these cultures, B just beautiful people, uh, broad faces, high cheekbones, great beauty, great uh, uh, physical attractiveness, and of course the straight teeth, uh, freedom from tooth decay, and, uh, and freedom from dental deformity. So none of these people needed braces. They had the, the physical development of their bodies, including the face, allowed the um, perfect development of the teeth. And of course, you know, that's the kind of first thing you look at when a person smiles at you is their teeth. And the reports that he had been getting back about what beautiful teeth these people had was what inspired him uh, to do these explorations and these studies. So he went all over the world and all of the diets were different. You had the Eskimo diet that was hardly any plant foods at all and extremely high in fat. You had the Swiss diet, which produced equally beautiful people. Very little meat in that diet. It was dairy foods and grains in that diet. Uh, the Outer Hebrides, uh, they had seafood and oats. That was their diet. But they were splendid people, beautiful, straight teeth, freedom from disease, no tuberculosis. Then in the South Seas, we had diets based on fish and pigs and uh, a lot of uh, plant foods, including tubers like cassava. 
Uh, so um, he found this all over the world. And, you know, people wanted him. To, so, you know, what did you learn from this? What's a healthy diet? And all of these diets were very different. What he, what he did, though, he did answer the question, what is a healthy diet? And the answer is summed up in two words, nutrient dense. Very high, these diets, he, he analyzed the foods that he took back to his laboratory. These diets were very high in minerals, very high in vitamin C and uh, B vitamins. But the real shocking, surprising thing was how high these diets were in what he called the fat-soluble activators, vitamins A, D, and K. Now, they got these from different places, but uh, some cultures got their A, D, and K from insects. Some got them from shark liver. Some got them from blood. Blood's really rich in vitamin D. So that was the underlying principle that tied all these diets together. And he showed how these vitamins, A, D, and K, are the necessary vitamins to build those splendid specimens, those beautiful, uh, well-built bodies, the strong bones, straight back, and wide faces, high cheekbones, and straight teeth. And that's what the Weston A. Price Foundation was set up to do to further his research to show the scientific validation of these traditional food ways. And uh, we've done that over the years with the many articles that have appeared in our journal and now are posted on our website. One of the most exciting things that we have discovered is the role of vitamin K in bone development. Uh, vitamin K is what prevents the growth plates from uh, sealing over too soon. So the, the bones grow long and you get uh, tall people, the bones grow strong. And the uh, facial bones, there's a growth plate on either side of the face. And that will grow wide if there's plenty of vitamin K in the diet. And vitamin K cannot work without vitamins A and D, so they all work together. So uh, where, where, do we get, where do we get these vitamins A, D, and K? We, get, we don't get them from plant foods. Uh, there's very little in meat. There's a little, but not a lot in meat. We basically get them from th three sources. One is certain types of seafood especially the livers of fish, things like fish eggs. We get them from organ meats, liver, um, all the different organ meats of the different animals, birds, fish, um, cows, pigs, and we get them from fat. So one of the big challenges for us is to show people that fats are not bad, animal fats are not bad, and that saturate, saturated fat is not your enemy. It plays many important roles in the body, and we don't need to be afraid of these fats. I was very interested uh, in, the t in the remarks last night that um, the pastured eggs, uh, no problem selling them. Now, on our farm, we cannot keep pastured eggs in our in our store. They just fly out the store and um, no matter how much we charge for them, they, they, they sell. Pastured chicken, uh, easy to sell. Pastured pork, uh, very easy to sell. Uh, our pastured pork gets really fat. I mean, the fat on our pork chops is about two inches wide. So that, that, that's easy. People, people like it. The beef is the tough sell, and that's what um, the gal was saying last night. When all this movement started for grass-fed beef, um, my colleague Mary Ennig and I were really quite dismayed because the beef was being sold as being good for us because it was lean. Okay, and when you look at what traditional people did, they never ate lean meat. That was the cardinal rule. In Australia, when they hunted an animal, if that animal was too lean, it was called rubbish, and it was thrown away. I uh, read a wonderful article recently about Australian Aboriginal people hunting turtles. And in the daytime, they could tell if the turtle was fat inside by the folds of flesh on the turtle's front arm. But they also hunted the turtles at night, and when the turtles came out of the water, uh, they needed to know whether these turtles were fat because they didn't want to kill a, a skinny turtle or a lean turtle. How did they know? They smelled the breath of the turtle. And they could tell by the breath of the turtle if the turtle was fat. 
kind of neat. <laughs> so I think the big challenge for uh, those of you involved in holistic management is getting some fat on these animals because they will be a lot more consumer acceptance if if the beef has got some fat in it it just tastes better and uh, you do this with your breeds you do this with um, you know uh, gra your grasslands developing your grasslands and I, I hope I am not going to have you kick me out of the room when I say this but I would consider a very short period of some grain finishing at the end <laughs> to really get a good price for your beef. Just a very short period. After all, the fatted calf, the fatted calf was the meal that was served to the prodigal son, okay, when he came home. It was like the best piece of food that you could give to someone. Uh, the best piece of food served at the greatest celebration when the prodigal son comes home. That was the fatted calf. So, uh, we need to, I think you need to understand uh, the, the good things about your beef and about the fat in the beef. Uh, we are starting to do studies on the vitamins in, in beef fat. Uh, we already did vitamin K and sure enough there was more vitamin K in the grass-fed beef fat. That's a real selling point. Uh, we, all, we already know that there's more vitamin E in the grass-fed beef fat. A and D, we're going to get the results back fairly soon, but I'm, I can predict that there'll be more A and D in the grass-fed beef fat. This, these are things that you can say to your customers. These are the critical fat-soluble vitamins that you need for growth and development, protection against cavities, um, even protection against heart disease. Uh, there's an, another uh, very interesting fat in uh, a fatty acid or nutrient, let me say, in grass-fed beef, and that is arachidonic acid. It's in the fat. Arachidonic acid has been demonized, just like cholesterol and saturated fat, but it's a critical nutrient uh, for many things in the body. Uh, and then, of course, there's the omega-3s, and the omega-3s are higher in the grass-fed beef. Uh, there's not a lot of omega-3 in, in any kind of beef fat, but they definitely are higher and the ratio is better in grass-fed beef. But the point is all of these things are in the fat. The A, the D, the K, the rachidonic acid, the omega-3s, they're all in the fat. To get the benefits from grass-fed beef, you mostly have to eat the fat. And I think that's the big challenge now for all of you involved in holistic management. Let's get these animals fat. The American Indian, um, I, and I know people say, well, if you, if you uh, get, uh, kill um, game, it's lean meat. But the American Indians uh, hunted animals selectively. They hunted the older animals, uh, an older uh, buffalo or elk or whatever, would have a big f slab of fat that had built up over, over time on the back. And of course, a lot of fat around the kidneys. There would be about 100 pounds of fat in a grass-fed animal. And that's what they wanted. Uh, when they killed an animal, the first thing they did was eat the brain, the tongue, the liver, and the marrow, the fattiest organs. How do we know that? Uh, anthropologists looking through the bone heaps, the trash heaps, they always find a very distinguishing uh, ax mark right up at the back of the skull. And that's where they opened up the skull to get the brains. The femur is in splinters in these piles because they opened it up to get the marrow. So they were eating the fattiest part first. We know that they saved all the uh, adipose fat. Uh, they rendered it and saved it. A uh, typical meal was pemmican. Uh, it was a travel food for them. That was the, the beef, the, the meat, excuse me, the meat that had been powdered and dried and pounded. That was put in a leather bag and then they poured the fat into the bag and sewed it up. That's, that's pemmican. It was about 80% of the calories in pemmican were from fat. Uh, so that's my message to you. I, um, we're all working together to, to really restore the earth. We, we're the prodigal sons coming home, right? Uh, we've uh, engaged in all these terrible kinds of agriculture, and all of us uh, you know, share the guilt in this, buying McDonald's hamburgers or eating chicken McNuggets. So now we're the prodigal sons coming home. 
Um, we are doing managed grazing to create splendid landscapes, splendid animals. We are restoring our local economies and let's create splendid people by enjoying um, great, big, juicy, fatty, grass-fed steak. Thank you. <laughs> I've lost a little bit of track of time, but I'm happy to answer questions until they pull me off the stage. Yes. Yes. Um, so the question is that grain finishing changes the omega-6 and omega-3 in an adverse way, and that is correct. But you have to understand there's very little omega-3 in beef fat. It's about 1%. And so it might increase the omega-3 to 2% and reduce the omega-6. And, and the ratio does get better. But the amount of omega-6 and omega-3 in beef fat is very small. What really goes up, and this is surprising, is the saturated fat. A healthy ruminant animal creates more saturated fat. That's what their rumens are designed to do, to take the unsaturated fatty acids in plants and saturate them with hydrogen. And so this is another thing I think you need to appreciate and understand if you're in the beef business, is that saturated fat is good. You don't need to be ashamed of it. And um, we're your best ally here. We're teaching people that saturated fat is good, that you don't need to be ashamed of it. It plays critical roles. And one of the roles that saturated fat plays is that it helps you use the omega-3 fats properly. Uh, the, omega, the saturated fat helps put those omega-3s in the tissues and keeps them there where they belong. It protects them from oxidation. So that combination of omega-3 in a nice balance with omega-6, also in balance with arachidonic acid, that needs to be there too, and all the saturated fat, it's a perfect fatty acid profile. But I think you need to uh, be proud of the saturated fat in beef and not to have to apologize for it. Okay, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, similar, yeah. similar question. Uh, A similar question, you mentioned the Native Americans ate very old animals with fat developed over a long period of time. So in an agricultural context, can we have the same nutrient content in that fat over a much shorter period of time? Oh, that's a really great, great question. It's something we'd be happy to, to look at. If you want to send us some fat from an old animal and a young animal, we'd love to look at that. So I, d I don't know the answer. But. Yes, good morning. Thank you. I'm curious about your marbling. We have been finishing animals on grass for 12 years, and our marbling is exceptional, and I don't know if it's where we live or not, but I don't see any reason at all for grain to have an exceptional, delicious, rich steak I, without I, putting any grain on it. That's fantastic. Would you please, please advertise in our journal? <laughs> Um, maybe even write an article for us. We, we want to know what's the best way to get that marbling. And to me, that is the best thing about beef. That's why beef is such a fantastic meat, because it does marble. And you get fat all the way through the meat. It makes for a delicious, tender meat. Um, we're not getting that in Southern Maryland. I'm not, <laughs> we're getting I'm, extremely well, lean meat, so um, I'm, I'm very interested in what your grasses are like, what your soil is like. We're high, we're high mountains, so we're high in TDNs, mm -hmm. we're high in uh, protein. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's beautiful high mountain pastures, but the other part is it takes longer. You're looking at close to two years before that animal's finished. You can't finish it in the 12 months, 14 months. We found that it has to be 18 to about 24 uh -huh. months. Okay. Could you write an article for us, how to get a marbling and grass-fed meat, please? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Hello. Um, can you say something about CLA conjugated? Linear? CLA? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, most of the studies out there tell you that there's more CLA in grass-fed meat. And the CLA is an anti-cancer substance, very, very good thing to have in our diets. I, <laughs> I have to tell you that we analyzed some grass-fed and gra uh, grain-fed beef, and we didn't find any difference. They were the same. I don't know if that's because of what they're 
now feeding, maybe they're feeding something to the, in, putting in the grains, maybe they're putting some flax oil or something in the grains uh, to, but we didn't find any difference. So, um, yeah, I have to tell you what we found. All and, right. And we were only one study out of many that, that did show a big difference, so. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Let's give a big round of applause to Sally Fallon. <laughs>